All right. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salaam alaikum, everybody. Uh, this is Salam al at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And our guest today is Wal Azayat, the CEO of Engage USA, uh, one of the thriving Muslim organizations engaged in, uh, in the elections and civic engagement, and uh, a wonderful partner, uh, both personally and institutionally, uh, uh, for myself and, and the Muslim Public Affairs Council, respectively. Thank you, Wild, for joining. I see you're 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 nice and warm in your uh, your pad there in Washington. Thank you. Thanks, Salam. Salam alaikum, everyone. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm in my living room. Um, it's it's uh, kind of a gloomy, rainy day, but um, you know it's nice and cozy, as they say. And thanks to technology, we're able to be with all of you. Yeah, and and. I imagine that that's the way things are going to be for a while for for all yeah. of us. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, first of all, you, you and your wife are expecting. I mean, your wife is going to do the hard part, but uh, bringing <laughs> that's in a what new they person to this world. Yeah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, um, we're expecting our first uh, born in thirty-five days. If she, uh -huh. uh, it'll be it'll be a girl. And you know we're super excited and trying not to be too anxious. Though I must admit, you know, and I want to make sure I don't, you know, freak her out. I'm not looking forward to going to a hospital right now, given everything that's happening. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just not really. Um, yeah, but uh, home you know, delivery but, is is also yeah, a high risk. No, no, no. Of course, we're going to go to the hospital. But a yeah. part of me, you know, when you are having a child. You discover new things about yourself and i'm absolutely a warrior i do worry apparently because you know i'm thinking just about the whole situation with you know the challenges at hospitals and face masks and respirators and all that stuff but yeah. you know i'm i'm to talk about allah right you and do your best you, and then you put your trust you in all God, you can absolutely. yeah um but but i'm definitely gonna bring with me you know you know what our gal is yes you know, the start <laughs> of the tribal men of, of our part of the world. I'm going to bring a pair just in case. To do what? If there's no masks, I'm going to... I'm oh, gonna you're going to use it? <laughs> <laughs> they're going to they're gonna think that I am... They're going to think that I'm a fidayin or something. <laughs> yeah, that's what I... That's, <laughs> you're going to scare away the virus. Uh, yes. Okay, yes. well, good. Um, you, you, you lived in Syria. Uh, for your childhood, correct? And tell us how that was born, under, yeah, under the Assad regime. Yeah, um, born and raised in, in, uh, in Syria, in Damascus, Syria, grew up there. And we immigrated as a family, uh, my, you know, my parents and my siblings and I, in 1988. And we landed in San Jose, California. So for those who usually get a call from me and they ask me why do I have the 408 number that's because I'm a I'm a proud Bay Area in fact I'm drinking from my UC Berkeley mug that I purchased my freshman year at Cal uh, I'm told about 25 years ago but I can't believe it it still looks pretty new so uh, yeah we grew up in Syria we immigrated I was 13 and you know I tell people this in, in public uh, events I'm exactly the person who's now banned by the Muslim ban, by the way. Yeah. Um, Syrian, male, Muslim, you know, forget about it. There's no way you're not coming here. And right. to think that, you know, I had a career at the State Department for 10 years working on national security issues. And then you got this, you know, person in the White House who, did he even serve in the military? I don't think he did. No. Okay. Never served, never, you know, like I, I was deployed to Iraq as a, as a, as a foreign service officer. Um, you know, to, to, to help our country come out of that mess mm -hmm. and to see someone who now tells us who's an American and who's not, and that Islam hate, you know, is a right. threat and people like us can't be here. So it's, it's, it's all surreal, but, but that really makes it that much more important that all of us, this kind of work that we're all trying to do yeah. continues and, and we keep the eye, you know, the eye on the ball and what's important this year. You know, and you know, you're absolutely right. One of the stunning and maddening and hypocritical and uh, crazy aspects of xenophobia is this notion that they're the ones who, have, who are patriotic and we're not. Whereas when you yeah. look at your family, my family, we have sacrificed more for America, uh, both uh, in terms of what our 
what our parents had to undergo um, in that time of turmoil where US policy did not help them, it helped the, the tyrant. And um, in terms of your foreign service work, our work here at the Muslim Public Affairs Council engage uh, in terms of um, aspiring to the values of our constitution. And, and, uh, and, and that's something that I think we always have to keep in mind, whether we're working on the Muslim ban or working for the civil rights of others uh, or um, uh, promoting uh, a, 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 an America for all, for all people. I think we have to keep that in mind uh, and remind people what we've actually done for America. Yeah. By the way, I'm seeing questions coming in. Um, so do you want us to, to respond to them or well, kind let me, of come, yeah. come to them later? We'll come to those questions okay, later, cool. but first uh, I wanted right. to, yeah. you know, um, first of all, how have, you, how have you and your staff adjusted, adjusted to this pandemic uh, crisis and the work from home? Um, yeah. Does that, people think we don't have anything to do uh, because we're, we're yeah. working in Washington and Washington is shut down. So speak to that in terms of how, have you, how you and your staff have adjusted. Yeah, so look, Engage is a civic, civic political organization. And, and for people who don't know, we have six chapters across the country. We're in Michigan, Florida, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Texas, and New York. And we have the headquarters in Washington, DC. Um, the core of what we do is to organize people to engage in the political process. And one of them is turning out Muslim voters. So every year we run phone banking, uh, you know, mass texting, and we also do door knocking operations to get Muslim voters to vote. So this year, and, and, and you know, it, it was really um, fortunate, we launched the Million Muslim Votes campaign, which is focused on turning out a historic number of Muslim voters. And we're very thrilled that MPAC is a partner of ours in this, in this effort and a number of other very good organizations. It's really a virtual operation because we're going to be running webinars, training organizers on how to organize, how to run effective phone banking, how to use the voter data to turn out voters. So that's going to continue. And what's been important is that we just communicate that to the community and the voters that the work continues. Organizers will still get trained. Phone banking and text messaging and others can still continue. What we cannot do is obviously door knocking and kind of civic in-person events, but just as we are right now, we can continue to convene virtually, uh, to engage with elected officials, to do training uh, opportunities virtually. For our organization specifically, we, you know, and, and this is what I've told our staff and, and I will share this with you guys. This is not the time to make new stuff. So whatever your core, business or offering is as a nonprofit, you stay focused on it. Obviously, if it becomes very prohibitive, then you need to reassess. But for all of us, if you were, you know, making bicycles, don't start making cars or airplanes right now. Uh, make sure that you look at the core of your work and ask yourself, can I continue to do it virtually and explain that and make sure that your audience can understand that and partake in it. So that what we've been doing, we've been putting out uh, communications to explain that organizing issue advocacy and candidate support can continue and that whatever needs to happen virtually now that we're able to do it and we're you know we're continuing the battle rhythm of our staff we've always had you know a weekly convening our DC office now we're having a daily convening a quick one just to check in um, and communicating what we're doing not only to the external audience but internally to our own folks and our own board members and, and local committees that, that help co-manage these chapters. So just being clear on what you're gonna do, communicating it properly and, and trying to stay positive as much as possible. And actually another thing to, 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 to make sure that people put on uh, the video function for Zoom because I've noticed that when we don't see each other, things can become impersonal and, um, you know, it, it, you kind of don't see how people are thinking or feeling when they're talking with another. So one of the pro tips is turn the video on when you're doing work. Keep that personal interaction <laughs> as much as possible. That's, that's good advice. I'll, I'll... What are you guys doing? What's going on with you guys? 
I think it's the same. I, you know, with, with us, you know, in terms of policy, uh, you know, I, I don't know how much we can talk about uh, the legislation that we were working on because, for example, the Muslim ban issue has yeah. been postponed. So we don't know when that's going to come back. So mm -hmm. it, we, we're focusing more on the, the response to the COVID-19 crisis and, um, and looking at, and for example, today, the stimulus package, we'll, we'll be looking at that yeah. Looking at how it helps people, um, civil rights aspects to the various uh, um, legislation that's coming out. There was a report, for example, that the DOJ uh, was going to uh, suspend certain uh, rights uh, of, of, of um, during yeah. investigations. So these are things that, that we need our organizations uh, to do that kind of work, to keep an eye out on the government uh, so that it doesn't pull that fast one, like it did right after 9-11 with the Patriot Act. Nobody read it, they just passed it. And then we're still suffering from that legislation uh, after uh, about 20 years. No, that's a, that's a very good point. You know, for, for organizations like ours who are dealing with policy and advocacy, there is, you know, the response to the health dimensions of this crisis. And then there is the response vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 the effects this health crisis has had on you know, personal security and privacy and religious freedom and the economy. Right. So, you know, one area we're really taking a close look at is the impact on small businesses. Yeah. Um, you know, America is all about small businesses, despite what, what, what uh, people assume. And the Muslim American community is a big chunk of that, actually. And so we've been hearing a lot from our community members about the urgent need for, for, certain measures from the government to shore up small businesses. And, you know, I'm, I'm personally, you know, happy that it seems that Republicans and Democrats have agreed on the stimulus package. Uh, we definitely want to, you know, take a deeper look into what it really means in terms of assistance to individuals and small businesses. And we'll look forward to your analysis as well for you, you know, from, from impact. Um, and that's actually something that we're going to do with, discuss with Representative Andy Kim this Sunday, by the way, who sits on the Small Business Committee uh, in Congress. Uh, he's a congressman from, uh, from New Jersey and a good friend of the community. And you know, I'm happy that you'll be joining us for that as well. So I think engaging with members about the specifics of this legislation, I also heard about this very troubling request by DOJ to suspend some basic civil liberties during this crisis. We've gone down this road before right. and it's, irrespective of who the president is, that's very worrisome, but especially right. under this presidency. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's turn to the elections. Uh, so you have the Muslim, Million Muslim uh, Vote Campaign. Yeah. And, and we're proud to be partners with Engage on that. Tell us about that and, and what your goal is. Is yeah. it literally getting a million Muslim votes in your database? That would be, that'd be tremendous. It's getting a million Muslims to actually vote and to measure it as much as possible. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're, the census is happening right now. And, you know, you can't say that you're a Muslim, and I'm not sure you want to do that anyway. Um, so it's, it's difficult to figure out exactly the number of Muslims in America. ISPU and Pew Research have done pretty good work to get a sense of it. Um, but what Engage does is we look at the registered voter data, which is publicly available for every state. And then we run a number of ethnicity and kind of, you know, um, equations or algorithms to figure out likely Muslim voters. Um, obviously it's not gonna be perfect, but it's pretty good. And we've been perfecting it over time. So we've, we've, we've discovered that just in uh, a number of key states like Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, Virginia and Michigan and Texas, New York and California, and then New Jersey, there's well over a million Muslims who are registered to vote. So our goal is to surpass the million Muslim mark in terms of who will vote in the presidential elections in November. And the way we're going about it is we're establishing a network of organizers across the country and identifying organizers, giving them access to the voter data 
that we have secured and have perfected over time, giving them training on how to use it and how to mobilize their community, how to conduct phone banking, texting, and door knocking whenever that's available again. But now we're gonna be educating people about absentee ballots and vote by mail, because that may become even more important than ever. And cumulatively together, we wanna have this campaign, this national campaign of all of these wonderful Muslim organizers and organizations pushing together to turn out a historic number of Muslim voters. And we really think we can do it. Uh, I know this crisis kind of uh, puts that in doubt in some minds, but, but the one thing that is absolutely important for us to understand is as Muslim Americans, and I suspect other minority communities, we cannot afford a dual pandemic. The first one is this crisis we're dealing with. The second one is, is if we stay home and we don't vote and we let, you know, the current situation continue for us like the Muslim ban and other, other issues have impacted us greatly. So engage and its partners. And look, this is a national campaign. You know, we put it out, but it's for all of us. Um, engage doesn't just own it. It's for every organization that really wants to mobilize uh, voters. It's crucial that we together work to educate the community that they can still request their absentee ballots. They can fill it at home. They can request an absentee ballot and get it at home and fill it out and mail it in. And obviously every state have different uh, rules and regulations on that. What we're gonna do as part of this campaign is put out communication that explains all of the stuff and people can find it at millionmuslimvotes.com. And we will be putting out and disseminating social media information and information to our partners like you guys to share it with your audience as well as it comes. Wonderful. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll highlight it on our website yeah, too. Please. That'd be great. Yeah. Just educating people that I just filed my request. I know it's DC. We're, we're pretty liberal here, but I requested a, an absentee ballot already for us. You know, I, I, I know of certain disinformation campaigns that tell people it's okay, you can, you can uh, text your vote from home. Um, yeah, I know, it, it, it's, <laughs> no. but, but, but that's one of the scams that is uh, being hot. And why some people did stay home. Oh, man. Um, I mean, part of the problem is, is of course, uh, the, the disenchantment and people disaffected with the political process. But the other part of the problem is disinformation by uh, Russia, foreign, foreign mm. uh, governments yeah. uh, trying to influence the, the elections. Um, ha have you guys discussed uh, ways to mitigate that or address that within our own community? It's interesting you mentioned that there is a collective of, of organizations from our community that have been uh, coming together to talk about um, this is this information and hate uh, geared towards the Muslim community and looking at tools to identify it when it happens and how to respond to it. Um, I think vigilance is going to be very important and sharing knowledge between our organizations and disseminating it in a very clear way. One of the problems, though, and challenges is you know, social media, rather than doing a good job informing people, bringing them together, it's, it's done the opposite in many, ways, in many ways. Yeah. There's just so much information out there and you believe what you want to believe. But I think it's very important that credible organizations in our community, like MPAC and CARE and ISNA and ICNA and Empower, right? All those organizations and, and, and engage on stuff like that, they put out consistent unified messaging and guidance. I'm very happy that there is a COVID task force, for example, that has come together mm -hmm. uh, of really like all the major and even notable local organizations, some like 80 organizations have come together, it seems, to disseminate consistent information, reliable information, regarding this pandemic, but also, also the impact from it, including possibly on policy and, 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 and elections. This, this texting scam worries me actually, because one of our goals is to get people to commit to vote. And we found that when you, when you take an action and you say, 
I'm going to vote in this election, you're actually more likely to vote. Right. Human psychology is very funny. Uh, so we have a we have a number that we ask people to text so they can promise that they will vote. Mm. And then we use that information to remind them. Right. Not because we want to you know, do something nefarious with their data. But once we have them in our database, we're going to send them messaging, say, hey, guys, remember, you promised to vote. Right. So you should vote. Right. So I just hope it doesn't get, you know, viewed as, as a likely scam or anything Probably. like that. Or somebody, somebody I have our it. policy director and, and legislative director, Iman Awad, with us. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's, let's look into this. Now you got yeah. me worried. Yeah, I mean, the main thing is if somebody um, starts masquerading as Engage USA and then oh, tells those yeah. people, hey, by the way, since you texted us, you can now text your vote, so it's okay. okay let's not give them ideas right now. So <laughs> just, no, these are happening already. I'm great. telling you, they're I happening. Just, yeah. You know, there's so many things I can worry about right now. Yeah. Um, well, how but, are you going to measure? Security is important, vote? by the way. So data security yeah. is very important, and we've invested in in-house data expertise, by the way just so you know. Yeah. And we have connected with the Movement Cooperative, with, which is a very large, successful, strong um, um, voter mobilization and data organization. And so we got a lot of technical support from them on that, but we do take it seriously. How are you gonna measure the vote? Because I've seen polls, some people, yeah. I see polls, say, oh, you know, we 80, don't do polls. 89% of the Muslim community yeah. voted in this. How do you deal with that? Mashallah. Yeah, takbir, and then it's over. Takbir. Yeah. Um, well, so after the election, every state board of elections releases the election results. And they, you can get in there and it will give you the files of every person who voted and every file of person who is registered to vote, by the way. Mm -hmm. And so we run a ethnicity and name match algorithm that tells us the likely Muslim voters who voted in our last cycle, right? And obviously there's gonna be a plus minus margin of error. Um, and we found it to be pretty good indicator of the trends. So, because you're looking at the same data set year in, year out, and then you're seeing whether there's a percentage increase up or down. And so we're able to tell that more or less, for example, 110,000 registered Muslim voters voted in Florida in the 2018 midterm elections, okay? And we know that I think there was about, um, I'm sorry, we know that there was 110,000 registered Muslim voters in Florida mm -hmm. and that 60% of them voted in the last midterm elections. This is how we do it. And we can compare it to the general population numbers as well and to do a comparison of where we are vis-a-vis the general population and how much more work we need to do. You know, I'm happy to report that in places like Virginia, by the way, Muslims are voting at about the same rate as the general population. This is big deal. We're normally well below. So some of our target areas this year are gonna be Michigan and Florida, where Muslims vote below the general population. And given how important electorally those states are, that's, that, those are focus areas for us. How do you deal with Muslims who are doing political fundraising, but in such a stagger, uh, scattered and... I just yell at them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, how do we deal with that? Because it, it, the reality is, I think, and what you and I are saying is, guys, either we organize the vote or we organize the fundraising. And if you're not going to do either, then yeah. really, there's no way to wield influence in the system. That's how minorities wield influence. Yeah, look, on organizing the vote, I know Muslims have liked to think of themselves as a, as a block that, that can vote one way or another. Look, I mean, I think electorally as a strategy, we have to be cognizant of a few things. One, there are such things as quote unquote Islamic values. There are American values, and then people fall on the spectrum of that. And so it's perfectly reasonable that people may end up considering themselves as Muslim Americans and support the Republican party or the Democratic party or the more conservative or the more progressive parts of those two parties. What's important is that number one, we vote and that people know that Muslim Americans vote. These are people who vote. To me and to engage, that's, that's the most important thing. 
Second is that, that we are engaging and voting in an educated, informed, and smart way. So people don't just take our vote for granted, irrespective of which party they are. So they say, you know what, Muslim Americans, they vote, they know what they're talking about, they research, research the stuff and the candidates, and they're gonna hold us accountable. We can't really BS them. For us, if we can achieve that level of civic um, uh, sophistication, that's great. Irrespective of whom we vote for at the end. We think that that's the long game here. Now, in some cases, especially like congressional races or local elections, Muslims organizing their vote to get a, a bigot out of office or to promote a really wonderful candidate and to show that they can get it done is very powerful. And so Engage looks at these local and state elections through that prism. The national picture, less so because we're just 1% of the population and you know we're dispersed. Uh, but in this particular election, I'm gonna put on my partisan hat, uh, Engage C4 and PAC. Um, it is clear that the Muslim American community and let alone the country cannot afford another four years of Donald Trump. So we're gonna do everything we can to turn out voters in key swing states to get them out of office. That's our goal. Uh, as engaged action and PAC. Um, for the money, all too often, we all know them. There are wonderful people in our community who are, I mean, some of them are patrons of our organizations and they just love to give checks to candidates because they think, well, I don't know if they love it, but they just feel that this is the only way I'm gonna influence these politicians. This is the only way I'm gonna tell them that they need to do more on Syria or to do more on you know, Afghanistan or to help the Rohingya. And we, you know, all we can do is engage them and explain to them that number one, unity effort, effort is gonna be more productive. Individuals are not institutions. They cannot thoroughly vet these candidates. But more importantly, they cannot hold them accountable. If you're an individual donor and you give a $10,000 check and you are a busy doctor, for example, you're not following up on the legislation and you're not, I mean, yeah. heck, we have you a hard might time. Might as well just throw it. that money away. We have a hard time to do yeah. it. Yeah. So they just give the money, they do the picture, and then, yeah. you know, they get them invited to a dinner, et cetera, and that's that. You and then they wonder, them, yeah. and then they wonder, why is Palestine still not free? Mm -hmm. Why are the Uyghurs still incarcer incarcerated? Why is Syria still the travesty that it is? Why is, why is, why is? Well, that's why. We're not pooling our resources and we're not. And then what's important is they're doing organizations like you and us a disservice because when they're giving the money outside of our channels, when you send your legislative person or government relations person to the Congress, all they can go by is the power of their argument. And they're wonderful people and smart people. But if they can't connect that to the money that's being contributed or to the votes that are being cast on the ground, good luck. Yeah. I mean, that's the way the political system works in America. And, and other communities have figured out how to do that. And, but look, I think we're, we've turned a corner, by the way. I really think that by uh, coming together as organizations and us becoming more sophisticated, and having these different operations talk to one another, um, I, I think we're making a better case now for elected leaders to actually pay more attention to our issues and take them more seriously. Um, so let's let's go out there and, and talk about the primaries. Mm. Um, when do you think they're going to resume? Uh, I mean, are, are, we're not going to get the same uh, voter turnout. I think if if the, the longer we prolong these. Uh, scheduled uh, primaries. Yeah, um, I mean, we are keeping a very close eye on uh, the various states that are still out there and whether their primaries will be postponed and to what dates. This is where the education piece is very important. And this campaign we're all a part of is going to have a big educational component. Just educate people, hey, this is when the primary is going to be. These are the latest rules and regulations about it. Let us know if you have any questions. And um, here are the specific 
things you need to do for your local, state, and national elections, specifically as pertains to ballots and any information that first-time voters need to know. So Engage is going to put out this information regularly. Sign up to get our communications, not because I want to spam anyone. I'm not interested in that. But we're only going to put out important information on local, state, and national elections. All we can do is put the stuff out, right? I can't force people to read it and to act by it. And I really am counting on MPAC, an organization like you guys, to share the knowledge that we are all putting out. So if there's stuff you come across and you feel we should disseminate, we will disseminate it and vice versa. Um, so that's a really important piece. I really think that there's gonna be a push, and this is where you guys as a policy organization should consider pushing for expanded voting rights, vote by mail, absentee ballots, and extending deadlines for people to turn in because you guys know that in most states, you can get the absentee ballot, but it doesn't get counted until the day of the election. Can you imagine the effort to count all of this stuff this year on the same day? It's not gonna happen. So we also need to temper our expectations that we're gonna have the results on the day of or the day after. I honestly think this year is gonna be so unique. The results are gonna trickle and they're gonna take a while to tabulate and we should be okay with it. Now, a part of me is like Donald Trump may literally get to stay in, in office longer than, than he needs to if this thing drags out. I'm just joking here, but I think we should also, all of us, take a step back and focus on making sure that people vote and that their vote is counted and that we in the policy and advocacy arena advocate to make sure that those rights and are, are are guaranteed and that voting is as accessible and as easy as possible this year. Um, people are also confused by the ballots. I mean, I get calls asking me, who should I vote for judge? Oh, yeah. What about this proposition and this state initiative yeah. and this county and this city? How do you deal with, with trying okay. to educate people on, on uh, and, and, not, and, and also how, how is it that we can help people not be so intimidated by that? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, this conversation is a part of that. Uh, we've done town halls and webinars in the past to demystify this entire process. Um, uh, regarding ballots and who to vote for and all that, so Engage has a, has a dual approach to this. One is in a nonpartisan way, we put out um, voter guides in terms of assessments of the candidates and where they stand on the issues. Mm -hmm. So in particularly the states where we operate, like in Michigan, Virginia, and Florida, as well as Texas and Pennsylvania, we put out communications just saying, hey, here are the people running for office. Here's where they are on Medicare, climate, gun violence, et cetera, without telling you what to do about it. Just here's our unbiased opinion. But as we get closer to the election, Engage PAC, our political action committee, does make endorsements and we have a recommended list of people to vote for from the perspective of what is good for the country and for Muslim American uh, Americans across. Now, this is subjective. This is our view, but we do base it on a few criteria and I think it's important for people to understand our methodology. One, everybody we endorse, we had asked them to fill a very extensive questionnaire where they answer questions about their stance on domestic and political and, and foreign issues. Second, we do community surveys. Third, because of our grassroots model, we pool and poll our local chapters, staff, volunteers, and board members. And we look at the public record of these elected officials. And then we make the best uh, decision that we can with the resources that we have to make a call on whether this candidate is worthy of, of our vote as Muslim Americans with an S at the end. Um, and alhamdulillah, look, in 2018, 137 of the candidates that Engage PAC decided to endorse, 137 out of 200 that we endorsed won their race. So 
um, this is something we want to continue building on. So I really urge people who are interested in knowing more about um, the candidates that Engage looks at and those that we decide to endorse to check out our endorsements at engagepack.org and to look out for emails and social media postings by Engage Pack between now and election. Great. Um, and I know you guys do assessments of candidates and I'm very, you know, you guys have such good expertise in research and analysis and I would love to do joint products with you guys. I mean, we're not in California, we're not on the West Coast. So if there's anything we can do to amplify, you know, your research on candidates and your community's views on whom should be supported or not, we would love to amplify that. Yeah, let's do that. Let's take, I, mean, I would love to do that. Yeah, let's also take a, a few states and, and look at the various uh, state ballots. Yeah. And we can come out with a, with a recommendation on, on that. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. That would be good. Uh, last question. Um, you know, Biden is, the, mm. is still the front runner. Is Nobody he? has seen. Yeah, I know. Nobody has seen or heard from Where's him. Where's Biden? <laughs> yeah, where is he? No, no, I'm kidding. Where's Joe? Uh, but, my, but, my buddy Farouk mad at me now. Yeah, well, well, well yeah, but, but Sanders, mm. it doesn't look like he's, he's not, he's not going to bow out anytime <sighs> soon. Look, um, you know me by now. I mean, I speak my mind about these things. Um, and, and Engage USA endorsed uh, Bernie Sanders, right? Engage PAC. Engage PAC, sorry. Don't get, get that me, other hat. Don't, don't, have, don't, don't get me in trouble with the IRS. No. Uh, engage Political Action Committee. Yeah. Remember that process I told you about how we vet our candidates? Mm -hmm. We did it for the presidential candidates. And we looked at the history of engagement with the Muslim community and uh, you know, people they've hired in senior roles on their campaign. Look, it's clear. Bernie Sanders made a decision that Muslim Americans are going to be part of his electoral strategy. It's clear. Um, he, is, he has proactively engaged our community. He has embraced it in a very visible and I would say historic way. Um, something like 40 to 50% of Muslim Americans surveyed favor Bernie Sanders. And we did the questionnaires and all that. And we decided, look, it's a no brainer. Bernie Sanders, if you want, like, if you look in the Muslim community and what they care about, with exceptions, because no candidate is perfect. And as a former government official, I will tell you, any president will disappoint you and break your heart on some issue. It's very important to know that. I am not gonna, you know, drama, uh, romanticize Bernie Sanders or anyone else. They all have their flaws, but, all things being equal, we endorse Bernie Sanders, and we're very happy that we did that. And clearly, since that endorsement, you know, he won a few states, and then uh, Biden, you know, uh, regained momentum, and now is the front runner. Um, we're gonna see what happens in the coming months, especially given the situation we're all in. I suspect Biden will continue to win. I suspect that he will ultimately be the nominee. But we have to see and we have to be true to our endorsee and should he, and we're gonna to continue to promote him, but we have absolutely every interest as Engage PAC to support the Democratic nominee this year. So if at some point Bernie drops out or Biden just emerges and forces the situation, we're gonna support Biden. And we're going to make sure that the community and its issues are elevated and taken seriously by the Biden campaign. Yeah. And we are already doing that in terms of communicating the issues and recommending people to join the Biden campaign just because it's very prudent to protect the equities of this community, just as we 100% support Bernie and we've been canvassing for him, we're doing phone banking for him. And at the end, we look, we look at this as bigger than all of us and any particular candidate, especially this year. And I think we should uh, continue working all the way up to the Democratic National Convention to make sure that our issues are incorporated or at least yeah. addressed at the platform. Yeah. And, and, and it, it, to me, you know, I, I know the importance of, you know, endorsing and, and working with the campaigns, but I'm not so much into the horse race. 
I'm, I, I I think it's it serves us better. Number one, not not to be committed to one candidate or or another, to to have people, you know, let's say the majority of people mm -hmm. want candidate X. Fine, let let them go and work. But even if you get a handful to candidate Y, I think you got to work with both campaigns. But always stress that no matter what, it's the issues that are more important. It's the issues that are important. I completely agree with you. And look, um, there's no one way to do anything. And um, we made a decision to endorse in the primaries because we wanted to show the country that the Muslim vote could potentially matter. And we wanted to elevate Muslim issues earlier on in the cycle. And we didn't, and we felt that as a small minority, if we were gonna have a, sh a shot at doing that, it was better to do it in the primary. Now, we knew there was a risk. The guy we pick may lose, but we, re we absolutely f feel that the objectives have been achieved. We had a major presidential candidate embrace our community now in a way that we never thought possible. And not only him, but it forced the other candidates, and specifically Elizabeth Warren, if you remember, mm -hmm. but also Pete and Biden, to talk about issues that are important to us and to make commitments. So through our vetting process, all of them have gone on record saying on the first day, they would repeal the Muslim ban, for example, that they would all restore engagement with the Muslim community to previous levels. They would all restore the iftar at the White House. They would all take a look at the immigration restrictions and the refugee restrictions, specifically on Muslim refugees. So those are all wins that now we, our community can pocket and move forward on other issues. Well, great. I mean, th there's a lot of wisdom in, in, in the whole discussion. Wild, thank you so much uh, for taking the time uh, to be with us. And we're going to continue this, inshallah, uh, in the future. No, I mean, thanks so much for, for, uh, for doing this and for the work that you guys do. Uh, really, since day one, when I took over at Engage, uh, I think the audience should know that you have been the most supportive and generous of me personally, uh, as a mentor, as 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 a partner, um, and engage as as an excellent partner as, of ours. And look, I'll say this last thing: in our community, there's so many little organizations and big organizations, and and people worry about competition and resources. I am a firm believer that when when we work together in this way, um, we can actually focus on what matters rather than each other. <laughs> like, yeah. ooh, what is CARE doing? What is IMPACT doing? What is, right. you know, how are they going to, you know, encroach on me? Right. And we can actually focus on what matters, the real right. work. Right. And the pie does get big, get bigger. Yeah. The pie gets bigger. I mean, our, our organizations collectively, the civic political organizations, I mean, we are, we're small. We're, we haven't even we're, scratched the surface. We're not, I mean, we're, we're nothing. probably right. our... Look, let's put care aside because, mashallah, they have a bigger presence and they have a good budget. But all the other communities, uh, community organizations, if you put them all together, we're probably under $20 million. Right. That's, that's And you look to other communities, they're in the hundreds of millions. Per organization. Per, yeah. yeah. So, so, some, so someone came up to me <laughs> and thought that we were a, a $10 million organization. That's what people think engages, but yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep them thinking that because, yeah <laughs> you know, we're gonna fake it till we make it no, but but i'm an absolute believer that impact engage care um you know organizations like that that are trying to do this very difficult word uh, muslim advocates empower um all of us together we should be in the hundreds of millions of dollars and it's only going to come if we work together and present a a united front, not only to our community, but to the political establishment, to the media, and to the donor community, to the donor community, uh, the non-Muslim donor community, and also to the federal government, our government that takes our tax money, right. makes decisions on our behalf. Um, you know, we, as a, as, as a community, we have to get our fair share. So, and yeah. I, have, I have every confidence that, you know, working together with organizations like you guys, we're going to get there. Inshallah. Well, thank you so much. And next time we'll also talk about uh, how it was at the State Department and how organizations looked from the inside.
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll 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 uh, we'll take a look there. But thank you. Sounds you, good. You're a you're a great friend and a partner, and really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks everyone. Right. Stay safe. Good luck to you. Yes. And next time, maybe I'll do it. You know, with you in California. Inshallah. Bye. Thank you. Wassalam. Bye, everyone.